I'm ready. Okay. All right. So welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Luis Betancourt. I'm the director here at the Institute. And as you know, this spring, we're having a series of talks on the theme of what we're calling sort of generally urban cognition. But it's really about um, the issue that goes back to uh, anybody writing about cities and urban environments, uh, puzzling about how is it that people, individuals as sort of cognitive agents deal with the opportunities and the complexities of these environments that are socially, physically, and in many other ways, very complex, but at the same time, full of opportunities, but also pitfalls. And so these environments, of course, as we know, uh, shape our behavior, shape what we do and so on. And um, I think we increasingly have evidence and many studies from different disciplines trying to characterize what that process is, particularly with the idea of trying to better understand and foster human development, right? Better cities where people can do more of what they hope to do in their lives. So in doing that, uh, it's a great pleasure for me today to introduce uh, Dylan Frank and Luis. Uh, he is, uh, I'll introduce him just very briefly. He's currently an associate professor in psychology at, uh, at Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. It's a very beautiful place to visit. I, I was there just in the summer, though I missed him. But um, particularly if you go in the summer, it's a wonderful place. You got a bike and you get everywhere. And uh, he also is associated with a, another very beautiful place, which is Freiburg in Germany at a Max Planck for the study of crime, security, and law, which sounds a lot more applied. Um, his background is in, um, in a biological, um, um, sorry, I, I want to get this right. So in biological uh, anthropology, his PhD is from UCLA with uh, a number of distinguished people, including my friend Rob Boyd. And so what is special about Willem's work that uh, I really have been in love with, I've been reading his papers for a long time, is that it brings sort of an evolutionary lens into psychology. This is a difficult thing to do and full of pitfalls, but one of the main objects is to work with the concept of the life course, your life, if you want to imagine it that way, as sort of an object that can be designed and chosen to some extent by you, to some extent by the environment, uh, in order to allow you to do more things, you know, and this has to do in biology with when and how many kids one has and so on, but in human psychology becomes much more complex and interesting, and it has to do with, you know, whether we invest in the long term or not. So. With that, uh, I think today's talk will have uh, sort of uh, uh, an interesting conceptual framework of looking at human development, so what happens through your life course and everyone's life course, but also from the point of view of evolution, what we know there, and then also some illustrations about uh, Willem's work uh, as to how this comes together in Berkeley. So uh, I'll, lay, I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Mark Berman, who's professor in psychology, say a few words also about the work and how he sees it from his perspective. And then um, Elon will take it away. So Mark, please come on in. Yeah, with, uh, yeah and I just, I just want to say briefly, you know, uh, Willem is like the, to me, kind of like a pioneer in this area. And um, not many psychologists are taking this life history look at human psychology, but I think it's, it's very, very important. And I know many of you know that Luis and I have been talking about this a lot, about, you know, these decisions aren't made, it just like short time scale, but people sort of having this sort of life history kind of kind of approach about sort of predicting the future and how that's going to influence decisions. And Willem with his approach and his modeling, I think is really at the cutting edge of this. And I'm I'm hoping that that more psychologists take up this approach because I think it actually kind of is um sort of the way to kind of do psychology more effectively to really understand how, how people make decisions. So I'm really just excited um, to hear what, what you're going to present, Willem. Um, we've, been, we've been wanting to, to, to get you uh, to, to share your research with us for a while. So it's, it's really a great pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I feel really honored and, and also grateful um, to, to hear all these kind, kind words. Um, and I kind of want to promise that I will come to visit, you know, all of you in person uh, at some point, because I would really love to, you know, part of the joy of, of academia is to sit down with people and exchange ideas and, and develop projects. And that's, of course, easier to do in person. So hopefully we can sort of see this as an introduction, but maybe our horizon will be, um, will be longer. So I will be talking about developmental adaptations to stressful conditions. And my talk has four parts. I will first get us on the same page in thinking about development and evolution. Then I'll talk about adaptive strength and strategies. 
the long reach of early adversity, and then finally quantifying the human ecology. Now, in The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin mostly wrote about birds and beetles and butterflies, except towards the very end. There he made a statement about humans. He said, in the distant future, I see open fields for far more important research. Psychology will be based on a new foundation that of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation. So that's quite a prophecy to make um, over 150 years ago. And this prophecy has become partially realized in that evolutionary thinking is becoming more integrated uh, with psychology, but there are also obstacles. And among those obstacles are misconceptions about what it means for a trait to be evolved. So um, in the literature, the term evolved has often been associated with terms like innateness, present at birth, unchanging during development, universal in the species, and not learned. Now, if you think that these terms are what it implies for a trait to be evolved, then things like species typical change during the lifetime would fall outside of evolutionary thinking or individual differences, which are not universal in the species or cultural variation, which is learned socially in this case. Now, a better way to think about how evolution and development are related to each other is to think of them as nested processes that are operating on different timescales. So across generations, evolution, and in particular natural selection, favors particular developmental toolkits, as it were, over others. It favors those toolkits that are good at constructing, in particular environments, individuals that are successful at surviving and reproducing. And so across generation, there is a selection of developmental toolkits happening. And then within generations, those toolkits through interactions with the environment are building individuals that may or may not survive and that may or may not have high or low reproductive success. And so if you take that point of view, then you can imagine how natural selection might in some cases favor developmental mechanisms that produce species typical development. So for example, humans tend to have two eyes or, or mechanisms that adjust individuals to their local ecology based on experience. So for example, our stress response system is adjusting to the level of threat in our environment and cultural variation. So mechanisms that have been favored to learn socially um, using the knowledge of others in the population. And all those mechanisms have an evolutionary history. Now, you may be familiar with terms like neural, cognitive, behavioral plasticity, and those all refer to an individual's ability to adjust its, its phenotype, its characteristics, uh, its brain structure and functions, or its information processing, or its behavior in response to experiences. In biology, people have one kind of overarching term for this, and it's phenotypic plasticity. And it's the ability of an organism to change its phenotype during the lifetime in response to environmental conditions. Now, in psychology, it's often taken for granted that there exists, that there exist these forms of, of plasticity. But in evolutionary biology, people ask really interesting questions. For example, when would you expect plasticity to be favored by natural selection? So mechanisms that have this ability to incorporate information from experience to adjust the phenotype versus mechanisms that do not do this like we develop two eyes. We don't, in the dark, suddenly develop four eyes. And I want to illustrate this briefly with an example of sowberry bugs. And sowberry bugs live in various places in the United States. And some male sowberry bugs engage in a behavior called mate guarding. And um, this curious behavior involves, after a, a mating, sticking around to kind of guard the female from other males who are potentially going to try to mate with the female. And if another male does mate with the female, then it's, she, she is more likely to, to have offspring of this other male. Okay, so that's not evolutionarily adaptive for a male uh, if, that, if that happens after a mating that, that this male has done. Now, some populations of sowberry bugs, in those populations, the ratio of males to females, the sex ratio, is fairly stable through time. And in those populations, the males mate guard a fixed amount. But there are also populations of sowberry bugs and they experience fluctuations in the sex ratio. So sometimes there are many more males, 
which means that it's adaptive to do a lot of guarding. And sometimes there are many more females than males, in which case it's adaptive not to do too much guarding and maybe search for other mates. And what's very interesting is that in those populations where the sex ratio fluctuates, males have evolved phenotypic plasticity for mate guarding, meaning they have the ability to adjust their level of mate guarding based on the number of females and males that they encounter during their development. So if you take the males from the stable sex ratio population and you put them in the lab and expose them to a different sex ratio, they just engage in the same amount of mate guarding as they would in nature. They cannot adjust it. Whereas those other males have evolved plasticity. And I think that example shows beautifully how natural selection in some cases, because of environmental features, favors plasticity and in other cases not. Which brings me to the second part of my talk, which is focusing on adaptive strength and strategies, focusing mainly on humans. Now, as just mentioned, I did my PhD at UCLA in biological anthropology. And in this during this PhD, which was a wonderful experience, we learned also a lot about um, various cultures across the globe and about human history. And <clears throat> one of the things that struck me during my PhD was that various forms of adversity have actually been uh, really quite prevalent uh, across human history, but also there have been times where there was actually, you know, the, the levels of adversity were not that high. So there's been tremendous variability in the adversity exposures that the human species as a whole over evolutionary time has experienced. So you can see the analogy with, you know, this, the soberry bugs experiencing variability in the sex ratio. Humans experience variability in, in threat, threat of predation, threat of disease, threat of violence and other kinds of threats. And so as a result, humans might have evolved phenotypic plasticity, the ability to adjust to various types of condi conditions. So I'm talking about all humans have this, have this capacity, okay? And if you're interested in the forms of adversity that humans have experienced, um, this might be a paper that, that, that you would find interesting. It's a paper I wrote with Dorsa Amir and we review um, many types of evidence from diverse fields on the various forms of adversity that humans have experienced. Just to give you one result that is not our result, but it's a result that other uh, people have, have, have shown, is the sort of best estimates are currently that um, at least across fairly recent history, but potentially also a more distant history, about a quarter of the infants survived to the first year. And about 50%, almost 50% um, of children basically did not make it past the age of 18. Okay, so those are just, and those are estimates and they are potentially imperfect, but just to give you an idea of, you know, the, the, the history of, of humankind has been tough and, and, and there's been a lot of variability. And so you might expect this plasticity. So when I was looking at the literature on non-human animals, you would sometimes see that non-human animals would develop enhanced cognitive abilities in environments that posed these kind of uh, forms of adversities, these kinds of threats and unpredictabilities. And so for example, rodent pups who receive low levels of licking and grooming, which is associated with you know, the mother struggling to kind of meet the basic needs of herself and pups, those show enhanced fear conditioning. They are faster at learning where dangers are in their environment. So that's an, an example of growing up in a, in a tough world and cognition being enhanced in non-human animals. But when I was reading the human literature, the dominant paradigm was clearly to think about how adversity, particularly if it was uh, chronic adversity, so prolonged intense exposures to adversity, how they um, tended to, and there are large individual differences, but they tended to be associated with um, impairments in, in cognitive functioning. So people exposed to these forms of adversities tend to on average score lower on a variety of cognitive tests. And so the inference of, of that pattern of results is that there are um, these impairments. Now, the discourse around those types of findings, um, you know, sometimes really made me wonder. Um, I, had, I had some concerns about the discourse. Let me put it that way. So, for example, just two titles here of papers published in science, but there are many more. I don't mean to pick on any particular authors or papers because this is a very common way to talk about it. But just to show you two titles, Poverty Impedes Cognitive Function, The Poor, Poor Mental Power. So that's sort of the prevailing discourse. Uh, or was the prevailing discourse in much of, uh, of developmental psychology. There were rare counterexamples, even before I 
you know, entered the field. So for example, Seth Pollack has done really interesting work showing in some studies, it's not always found also by Seth Pollack, it's not always found, but in some studies, uh, children who have been exposed to severe physical abuse, they actually are more accurate at identifying uh, angry anger in, in human faces. So um, in the graph here, you can see that the figure is you know, very degraded on the left. There, nobody can see what the emotional expression is. At the very right, the face is clearly visible. Pretty much everyone can see what the emotional expression is. But in the middle, where there's partial information, there you see individual differences. And what Seth Pollack and colleagues found was that um, children who had been physically abused were more accurate in this intermediate range. And that result really stands out against the backdrop of the existing literature, which is highlighting these uh, putative deficits in, in cognition. And so what I wanted to do after my PhD is to sort of work towards a more well-rounded view of development in, in kind of harsh and unpredictable conditions, focusing on a combination of strengths and strategies. And by strengths, I mean abilities that are enhanced by adversity. And by strategies, I mean behaviors that are adjusted to the affordances and constraints posed by a particular environment. And there were already quite a few people working on those strategies, and I'll say a bit more about that later, uh, but there were fewer people working on those strengths, the cognitive strengths. And so I developed what we later called the hidden talents approach. Uh, I wrote a paper in 2013 titled, Does Early Life Exposure to Sh Stress Shape or Impair Cognition? And in this paper, I outlined a research program. And I said, we can ask four questions. And the first one is, what challenges do people face in a given environment? So for example, a child who is neglected is facing different challenges than a child who's experiencing violence. So we first wanna ask, what is functionally the challenge that an individual is experiencing in this tough environment? Now, what kinds of skills might we hypothesize would the individual develop in that kind of situation? So for example, a child growing up in a threatening environment might develop sensitivity to cues to threat and therefore be able to detect threat faster in the environment. Now, what instruments do we wanna to use to measure these skills? This is a very important question. It's potentially also maybe the most difficult question. One could argue that many of the existing instruments that are used to measure cognitive skills um, are, are designed in such a way that they might a priori already be harder for individuals who come from environments uh, that are harsher and more unpredictable. For example, if they require individuals to sit still for a long time, focus on a static stimulus that is abstract, solving a problem that has no real world relevance to this individual. Irrespective of what the nature, exact nature of the problem is, that might already be harder for some individuals than others. For example, individuals who are used to scanning their environment a lot because they are vigilant, because they have to be in their, in their environment at home. And then, and this is an applied question, if we start identifying some of these potential skills, how can we leverage those skills to benefit the individuals who might have them? So we basically developed a body of empirical work. Um, we explored things like memory and reasoning about social dominance. In the study, we found mixed evidence. So we found some evidence that um, individuals exposed or involved, sorry, I should say, in more violence, that they were more accurate at, at, me at memorizing um, social dominance relationships, for example. But we, we, we also didn't find that on some other variables. But the, So it was an interesting mix of findings. Um, we explored whether individuals might be more accurate at forecasting conflict outcomes. So if you show two individuals in a conflict, can they predict what's going to happen better? We found no evidence in that study. And then in the third study, and this is the study I want to discuss in the most detail, we looked at, um, at, at memory and also attention shifting, uh, which is, uh, those are two cognitive abilities. Attention shifting is about quickly switching your behaviors between different tasks and working memory updating is about keeping track of a changing environment. And I'm going to discuss only the working memory updating findings in, in, in what comes next because of time constraints. 
And this study was partially inspired by existing work from cultural anthropology on ecological validity. And so one of my favorite studies in the field, and maybe some of you will know this study, um, explored the arithmetic abilities of uh, youth who were selling products on the streets in Brazil. And these youth had been, in an original study, they'd been kind of taken to the classroom and given math mathematics problems, arithmetic, and the youth scored very low on this kind of formal classroom mathematics test. And so those researchers said, well, these children clearly, you know, they, 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 are, they aren't able to solve math very well. And then there were other researchers, and I believe those researchers were from Brazil, and they thought, well, I interact with these individuals on the streets. And if I go to them and I say, I want, you know, 10 bananas, 15 oranges, and two breads and one pack of cigarettes, these youth know right away what I owe them and they're almost always correct. So how can it be that they score so low on this mathematics test in the classroom? And so they did a very ingenious study as mystery shoppers. So they went to these children and they basically posed to them problems that are of equivalent difficulty as those problems that these children were solving in the classrooms. And, um, and so, these children would answer how much you know this combination of products would cost. And they did that for several questions, several mystery shoppers. And then afterwards they would go to the children and say, hey, actually I'm a researcher. I asked you these questions because I was interested in you know, studying your abilities to do math. May I use your data? If I can, you know, I will only do this with your permission. And I, I think or hope that they would also be compensated for their participation. And those children did very well on this mathematics test done in this more ecologically relevant way. And I think it's a very important result because the gap between their ability in the classroom versus their ability on the market is something on the order of like 45% correct on the market, sorry, on the, in the classroom and like 90% or something like that correct in, in, in the, in the, on the market. Okay, what, what exactly it is uh, about the, 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 the more real world setting that made them so much better? Is it that there are real stakes? Is it that they're in a changing environment, that they're moving, that they're thinking about concrete products rather than maybe abstract numbers? You know, that's a really interesting question uh, uh, to explore. And recently, this main finding has basically been replicated by the group of Banerjee et al. Uh, in India with youth there who are also selling things on the street. So this study kind of inspired us to take a test that is very often used in, in psychology and to make it on one dimension more ecologically relevant and only one dimension because then we know the effect of that single manipulation rather than there being several things different. Okay, and we chose working memory updating because this is an ability that's useful in rapidly changing environments. You're keeping track of information as it's changing. And the task we used is called the continuous counters task. You don't need to remember that, but individuals would see geometric shapes like this. This is the standard version, not the version that we made more ecologically relevant. And, um, and then, you know, individuals would remember, okay, one square, one circle, one, sorry, one triangle, one circle, oh, two triangles. And so you could do this like nine times or 12 times or 15 times. Okay, so you're constantly updating. It's quite hard. Of course, I've done the task myself. It's really quite challenging. And the proportion correct is, uh, is, is how accurate you've performed. Now, instead of using these abstract stimuli alone, we also did a version with more real world stimuli. And this was really hard for us to decide what stimuli to use. So this is a lot to discuss here, but we chose money because that's clearly relevant from youth, from socioeconomically diverse backgrounds, a human face looking somewhat angry and um, a school bus. And this was the kind of school bus that these youth um, would go to school with. So it's a very famil familiar and relevant stimulus for them. And we, worked with youth from after school clubs and middle schools um, in, in, in Utah, and we tested 681 adolescents. The average age was about 13 and a half. About 43% of these youth received free lunch. And um, the uh, ethnic and racial identities of the youth were diverse, but the majority was, was uh, identified as white, about 25% as Hispanic, and, and, and the rest uh, identified as having another ethnic or racial identity. So here are some of the results of this study, okay? So 
what's important is that we believed that the more ecologically relevant version would help the individuals who came from kind of higher levels of adversity, it would help them more than it would help individuals who came from um, more favorable socioeconomic conditions. So on the y-axis, you see the proportion correct. You can see on the x-axis abstract. So that's the typical standard abstract version and the real world, okay, which are the stimuli that are more ecologically relevant. And then we looked at three independent variables, unpredictability, exposures to unpredictability, exposures to violence, I'll show that in a moment, and socioeconomic situation conditions. So for unpredictability, we found that generally the individuals from um, less unpredictable environments, more stable environments performed a bit better. And we did not find an interaction effect. So we did not find that individuals who were from backgrounds with more unpredictability, that they benefited more from the real world stimuli, okay? You can focus on the black lines. Those are the averages across the participants, the, uh, the median. Uh, sorry, now I'm forgetting whether it's the median or the mode. But anyway, those are summarizing the population. The individual lines are because we did a multiverse analysis. If you're interested in that, we can talk about it during, during the Q&A, but you don't, they're not, representing individuals. They're representing multiple times the same analysis done in different ways. Um, and so you want to focus on the difference here. At abstract, the difference is sort of similar to the difference with the real world. It's not the case that the real world stimuli close the gap. So now with exposure to violence, so here we see that the difference between abstract is substantial. Individuals who have had more exposures to violence tend to score lower on the abstract version of the task. But with the real world stimuli, their performance gets a big boost, almost up to the level or even up to the level of the individuals from low adversity backgrounds. So with more ecologically relevant stimuli, their performance becomes nearly or completely indistinguishable from the performance of individuals who have had less exposure to violence. And with SES, we find a similar pattern. Um, we did a multiverse analysis that means that you look at the data in, in, in a systematic, transparent, pre-registered, mul you know, multiple ways. Um, and, you know, we find this effect in a proportion of the time, but you can see what the general pattern looks like. So you may wonder, so, these, so we're talking here about tests that have been used hundreds of times that have been used many times to show lower performance in individuals, you know, who've had more adversity exposures. That's like what you see on the abstract task here, right? But with the real world version, you can see that the, the performance gap is uh, at least in some conditions substantially reduced. I see there is a question. Yeah, I think there's a couple of questions in the chat and I had a question um, too. I don't know, can you see the ones in the chat, Willem, if you wanna try no, I those, seen those first? Okay. Oh. You should read them, Mark. <clears throat> okay, yeah. I can read them. Um, okay. So the first one's from Ezra and he asked, um, is this a de developmental model? It seems to respond to people um, as a diagram of personalities is to avoid the fundamental lessons of society, depending on the social context one is born in, raised in, et cetera. Um, there can be deep and meaningful differences between persons and communities um, that is not limited to a scattered data set. So I guess he's wondering about sort of like, maybe Ezra, if you want to chime in, I don't know if I've captured the question quite properly, but um, about wondering about this this developmental model and does it uh, apply to like all different social contexts? You losing? No. Okay. Oh, okay. Can you hear us? Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you want to answer, Willem? Or oh, sorry, I thought I thought you were giving the um, the the yeah. the mic to the the person who asked the question to yeah. to clarify. I think in the interest of time, it would be good if you just reply. I think this is a larger question. Okay. If you want to touch on it quickly, you could. And then we can have time at the end. Okay. Sorry, I have to say I didn't I didn't fully yeah. understand exactly what the question um, is, but if it, it maybe the question is it, it's this reflecting like systemic factors in in in, in, in um 
Maybe Ezra, can are you want to talk, Ezra? Yeah, can can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's fascinating, Wilhelm, the um, the the kind of project that you're embarking on. But you know, just listening, I mean, um, the question that comes to me uh, directly is uh, whether violence is kind of is this is statistically articulable or um, whether it's um, perhaps something uh, uh, a little bit uh, more, as you were pointing yourself, uh, dimensional than, um, than, uh, than simply upbringing, uh, social context, and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and... Okay, Ezra, so, so yeah. let's, let's leave it there. So maybe you want to comment briefly. If you sure, yeah, so, so we have continuous measures of like self-report in this study self-reported exposures to violence so people answering questions like you know um how often have they been involved in a fight recently um in the neighborhood where they grew up was it safe to you know to go out after dark um do they know of you know people getting hurt through violence so it's like items asking people about their you know their their exposures self self-reported uh, in this case there are other studies where we have other types of measures. I didn't go into how we measured these dimensions um, because it, yeah, all of those things, of course, take take time, and um, I, I wanted to cover a bit, a bit, a bit of ground. Um, so maybe we can revisit it if if you if if that would be uh, needed later. Um, but I hope I have given a preliminary. So it's not like we measured exposure or not. It's we measured the degree of exposure to violence as individuals reported it based on interview questions and based on questionnaires. So it's a combination of people doing questionnaires and people interviewing um, individuals about, about these dimensions. So this, I think, raises you know, questions about, so this is a very widely used test where typ typically people only use the abstract version and they find this gap and they infer a deficit, okay? And here we see that the ecologically relevant content reduces the gap in some situations by quite a bit. And so one of the things we can talk about during the Q&A is what are implications of, of, of this for, um, for learning and testing environments, okay? Another study, and this has been done by Susan Brenner, who's a student at the University of Utah. This is a study that we did with a different sample, you know, online, uh, together also with Bruce Ellis and Ethan Young. But she wanted to see if we could replicate a finding that already exists in the literature, a finding by people like Michael Krauss and Pia Dietze and Knowles and others. Uh, and they have shown that people who perceive themselves to be in less favorable socioeconomic conditions. So here we're talking about kind of subjective perceptions of where people are in kind of the socioeconomic, you know, ladder. Um, that those people tend to score higher on tasks of empathic accuracy specifically emotion recognition. And that finding too stands out against the backdrop of all these other studies uh, suggesting um, impaired performance, lower performance on cognitive tasks. So we thought, okay, let's see if we can replicate that. And um, we use the reading the minds in the eye task. It looks like this. So you'll see just you know the eyes of individuals and then you have to say what that individual yeah, is, is feeling. Um, and uh, we also used a different task that other people had not used to study this question. It's the Cambridge Mind Reading Face Voice Battery. And here you see an individual actually talking and moving. So you get much more information. Rather than only the eyes, you get a talking, moving individual. Okay. And so I'm going to immediately jump to the data. Um, we replicated the effects that others had found. So we also found that higher subjective social class, as it's called often, I personally don't like that term that much, but it's the term that's used in, in this particular literature, um, that those individuals scored lower on these emotion recognition tasks. But what is new in our studies is that we found that this is actually driven by the males, basically. So, so females from various levels of subjective SES, they do about equally well on these emotion recognition tasks, but the males who identify as being sort of of high socioeconomic position, they do less well. And this was initially an exploratory finding. So we thought, huh, that's, you know, that's interesting. 
Um, we also found it on this other task, the face voice battery. So that was nice. It was sort of general across the two tasks. And then we did a replication study where we, you know, pre-registered this particular prediction. We said, well, let's see if we, you know, find this. And um, and we and we did. Uh, and so it it really appears to be a robust pattern. That, um, but it's, so it's very interesting that people who identify as being, you know, struggling more socioeconomically. Um, that they tend to score higher on, on this task. And why that might be is, 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 is sort of a, an interesting open question. One idea is that people, when they have fewer resources, they need to have more interdependent social relationships. They need to you know, be more connected with others to, um, you know, to help each other in times of need. They're more dependent on each other. For, for, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you have all the resources in the world, there's a way in which you're very autonomous and don't need other people to meet some of your basic needs. Whereas if your fridge breaks down and that means you have a serious problem and only three months from now you can buy a new one, you, know, you, need, to, you need the help of the people around you. you know? um, just an example, but um, that could be an, a, an explanation for, for some of these patterns. But we can also discuss this more if you'd like during the Q&A. If you're interested in this approach, this kind of strength-based approach to cognition, and you want to learn more about the findings, we have a nice animation that summarizes it in five minutes. I think that's a, a really um, kind of relaxed way to, to learn more about the approach. If you're interested in challenges for this approach and things that we don't know yet and methodological and theoretical challenges, this could be an interesting paper in trends in, in cognitive science. Uh, and so here I try to be critical you know, of the approach. Um, and say, sort of say, look, we, we know very little, let's not get too enthusiastic. It's, it's quite interesting, um, but we have so much to learn and, and uh, we really need to explore the generalizability of findings. And sometimes we find mixed results or no results. So, okay. Now I talk now about strengths and now I'll say just very briefly something about strategies. And this is the work I do together in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute in Freiburg. Now, I'm not going to um, steal Daniel Nettle's thunder. He's going to give a great talk. Daniel is a great person, a great scholar, and a great speaker. So he's going to give a talk uh, on May 3rd, which happens to be my birthday. Um, and so I Happy highly birthday. recommend um, this talk. But he will talk about these adaptive strategies uh, much more. But I will just say a couple of things about it. So we've done some theoretical work that I think is quite original. Uh, the PhD student at the time, Jesse Fenneman, who's currently a postdoc, what he did is he looked at different mathematical models that, and so not models of data, but theoretical models exploring the conditions in which it's adaptive for individuals to behave impulsively. So to not gather a lot of information, but just make immediate decisions um, and uh, uh, you know to value kind of immediate rewards over future rewards. And, and so there are models on this question in psychology, there are formal models in biology and formal models in ecology and evolution. And what he did is he you know, put all these models together in a meta-analysis. So rather than doing a meta-analysis of empirical work, it was a meta-analysis of, of formal models. And he created kind of a, a common language, like a common currency, if you wanna call it a framework, conceptual framework, and then he kind of compared the various findings uh, of these models. And so I think that's a really exciting um, project. And uh, there are you know, various conclusions that come out of this analysis, but one of them that comes up in all these different models or many of these models is that when resources are unpredictable, it can be adaptive for individuals to focus on present rewards. Okay, so to not delay gratification for a future reward that is unlikely to materialize. And here I want to discuss a study by Celeste Kitt and colleagues. And this is one of my favorite studies as well. And she used the marshmallow test, which might be a test that you're familiar with. So children, you know, they, they, they get one marshmallow and then the experimenter will say, I'm going to leave now for, for a while. And if you don't eat this one marshmallow, um, you'll get two. So that's better, you know, bigger, later reward. And then children do the funniest things, like they might open the marshmallow, take a little nibble from the inside and then close it and put it back on the plate as though you know, <laughs> nobody, um, as though nothing happened. Um, but anyway, she did a, a study where, and so children who, who grow up in, in environments that are more harsh and unpredictable tend to wait less long on, on, on the second marshmallow. Um, and um, you know, that, that could be very adaptively rational for them in, in their environment, if they're in a world where future rewards are less likely to materialize. And, and so what Celeste Kitt is, is she, she worked with children who did come on average from pretty stay, safe and stable environments. And they did a manipulation where 
the experimenter initially kind of promised like really nice crayons, but then either would or would, would not actually bring the child those crayons. And so the experimenter was like reliable or was not reliable in, in this kind of manipulation before they did the marshmallow test. And then they did the marshmallow test, okay? And then she showed that the, the youth who had been exposed to the kind of unreliable experimenter, they um, waited way, way shorter, showing that, you know, this kind of, if your environment tends to not be as stable and as reliable and future resources cannot be counted on, it, you know, children from favorable environments too are going to wait less long on, on these future resources. So it's a very ingenious experiment. Um, and so with the Max Planck group, you know, they are focused on, on crime, which is of course, you know, something that the vast, vast majority of people growing up in harsh and unpredictable uh, environments never engages in. Um, so it's focused on like, a, a you know, a, and there are many people who do engage in, in, in crime who do not come from such environments, but they are interested in the, in the relationship between, you know, exposures to adversity and how it might lead people to see the world as kind of chaotic, and people as being maybe more undependable in some cases and circumstances as being less controllable and how that might lead people to focus on immediate rewards and devalue the future more. Everybody is more focused on immediate rewards than future rewards pretty much. That's true in general, but it's more about like how that balance is varying between individuals and also how it varies as a function of state. You know, So for example, if I'm currently very hungry, my immediate need is to get food now. Okay, and so I might devalue future rewards to get my immediate basic needs met. It's a it's a logical, rational response uh, in some conditions. Um, and as I said, this institute focuses then on a small subset of people that might engage in delinquent behavior. And so crime, in some cases, offers one pathway to immediate reward. And so that's the link uh, that I have with this institute. Um, but Daniel Nettle will talk a lot more about adaptive behavioral strategies in contexts of uh, socioeconomic deprivation and unpredictability. Okay, so the long reach of early adversity, thank you for the clapping hands, that's, uh, that's very kind. Um, the long reach of early adversity. So why, so early life experiences tend to have, you know, larger effects than experiences later in life. There are many exceptions, but if you really zoom out, you know, early life experience, can have really a big impact on, on people's development. And one question we can ask is, well, why would this be the case? Remember from the beginning, I talked about natural selection favoring toolkits, right? Why would the human toolkit, so the species typical human toolkit, the toolkit that we all share, all people in all environments, why would that toolkit place special weight on early experience in shaping the life course for certain traits? Now, one idea, and I'm going to call this the, the external predictive adaptive response idea, this is, I think, the prevailing idea in the literature, is that the early environments, you know, they, they, it provides cues. Cues are kind of observations that provide information about the state of the world. So, for example, if I grow up in a neighborhood and I see violence, I see poverty, I see unpredictability, I go hungry, on a, I learn something about my environment, right? I learn that my environment has these features. And those cues might shape my current phenotype, like the way I behave in the here and now, but those cues might also predict my later environment. So if I'm currently in this kind of environment, maybe it makes it more likely that I'm in the, in the future, I will also be in such an environment. And therefore I'm going to also develop a life course that is tailored to an environment that has these features. So this is not something that people do consciously at all. This is also not specific to humans. This is just something where the developmental toolkit uses early life experiences potentially to, you know, to tailor the organism, not only to its current environment, but also to anticipate at future states of the environment. So this is, I think, the prevailing model. And so people have used this kind of model to, for example, try to explain why in um, you know, in environments that are, you know, that have high morbidity and high mortality, why there might be reproductive acceleration, particularly in, in females, uh, and why they might have their first offspring, for example, they tend to have it at a younger age than individuals who are growing up in more safe and stable environments. 
There are actually very important exceptions to this because if there's nutritional deprivation, then reproduction actually gets delayed rather than accelerated. But if there's no nutritional deprivation, but there is this kind of psychosocial danger, uh, then in, in, in a variety of studies, not always, people tend to find this acceleration. So maybe this is a predictive adaptive response. So what the individual is predicting in this theoretical idea is the future environment. So with Daniel Nettle and Ian Rickard, um, we proposed also a different idea. And this is an idea that I'd like to share with you as well. And we call this the internal predictive adaptive response. So the early life environment, you know, imposes cost on the developing body. At least it can, okay? So there can be, you know, um, faster erosion of telomeres, the caps on chromosomes. There can be a buildup of oxidative stress. And if that's the case, it could be that irrespective of the external environment, my life expectancy is going to be lower. If I have early life insults that basically like hurt my body, you know, irrespective of the external environment, it could mean that on average, all else being equal, this will shorten my life expectancy. Of course, there are individual differences, but on average, okay? And so what it might predict is sort of reduced somatic state. And then individuals might tailor their future phenotype to what their body predicts is going to be the trajectory of kind of, you know, somatic development rather than the external future environment. So I can talk also about more of this during the Q&A if people are interested, but this is really a different kind of evolutionary explanation for why there might be large effects of early life particularly early life adversity, not because individuals are predicting a future environment, but because they are predicting something about the decline of their own body as a result of insults on their body early in life. And we think that this is just a, a potential explanation. It's also complementary. So both processes could be operating, but we think that particularly in long-lived species where many years go between um, you know, early life and for, for instance, like onset of reproduction and maturity, uh, we think this is an interesting uh, idea. And so there are empirical papers since then, which show, for example, like prenatal stress effects in a wild long-lived primate, predictive adaptive responses in an unpredictable environment. So those studies show they have measured the environment, you know, over many years, and they show that the early life environment, for example, there's not very much food, doesn't predict the nutritional state of the environment, you know, on the relevant time scale, five or 10 years later. And so if that's the case, then you cannot predict your external environment in the future very well. And so then why would individuals tailor their, their phenotype to this future environment? Maybe they're just using the fact that their body you know, has suffered from early life adversity to predict shorter lifespan, irrespective of the external environment. Okay, very briefly quantifying the human ecology. And this is also something that I would really love to hear your thoughts about. I think this is something where we can really learn a lot still from the expertise also uh, in the room. So as I just mentioned, you know, for many of these questions, it's important to quantify how the environment over changes over time, over developmental time scales. Okay, so quantifying the human ecology. And biologists do this for non-human animals in really wonderful ways, you know, like food availability and rainfall over 30 years, you know, measured daily or monthly. Um, but you know, in 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 sort of in the psychological literature. When we have individuals in the lab, for example, or we test them online, we don't have this kind of spatial temporal developmental history over many measures over their lives. We might have something like a retrospective report, you know, or their zip codes, you know, during childhood, but it's very coarse. And so we are trying to work now on an approach that is kind of inspired by the work in ecology, where we want to um, quantify developmental histories of individuals, specifically the environmental exposures that they've had in the way that ecologists do this for non-human animals. And so you can think about variables like population size, age distributions, mortality, income, household sizes, crime exposures. So let me show you what we're thinking about. So this is Ethan Young. He's one of the two people that I'm working on this with. The other is Nicole Wallasek. And we are using governmental data here to create a spatial temporal developmental history for Ethan Young. So not for a population, not for one neighborhood versus another, but for an individual, okay? 
So individual, he lived in three places in the Netherlands. You can see the red dots on this map of the Netherlands, the blue, uh, the blue chart. Um, and then we can ask, for example, okay, so for Amsterdam, which is one of the places where he lived, um, what does violent crime, you know, what, what did it look like during a particular window that he was there? But we can also look at the Western Islands, which is a smaller region, you know, within the Netherlands. And we can even look at a block of 100 square meters around where Ethan lived on these various locations. So what you can have for a particular individual is for the time that they lived in location X, for 100 square meters around location X, you can have fine-grained, let's say monthly, crime data for that particular small area. Or you can take a bigger area. You can do this for different spatial skills. So we do this for the three places where he lived in Nijmegen, Utrecht, and Amsterdam. And we can do this for different dimensions of this environment. And then we kind of stitch them together, okay? And we can do this at different spatial scales. So very kind of um, coarse grained to fine grained. So like fine grained being, you know, the little block of hundred square meters, but coarse grained being like Amsterdam. But we can stitch the data together. And then we have a, a kind of a, a spatial temporal you know, pattern of exposures, in this case, to crime, but we can do it for all these other variables that the Dutch government has access for him if, if Ethan gives us permission to link, you know, um, these various things together. And then you have time series data. You have repeated measures monthly over many years um, showing the crime rates in a particular area where he lived. And then you can start calculating over this time series, you can calculate things like the slope, for example, or the variance or autocorrelation, you know? And so what we're, what we're interested in doing next, what we're working on right now is to try to quantify these environmental statistics, we call them, um, of individuals, and then use that to predict their behavior on cognitive tasks, measuring strengths, for example, or behavioral strategies, um, in the lab. So this is something that, you know, this is the work that we want to do in the future. This is the direction that we're heading. And so if, for example, there are people in the audience who know of other work that has connected these kind of governmental data sets with individual, you know, individuals going, for instance, to the lab, that would be really valuable for us to know because we've talked to various people and there are many wonderful and relevant literatures, but we haven't found much work doing that kind of stuff. So with that, I want to thank the funders that have enabled um, this work, and it's the James McDonald Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Jacobs Foundation, and the Dutch Research Council. And now I would love to hear also your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a really wonderful talk, Yolanda. Thank you. So we have a few minutes. Why don't you start? Yeah, thanks so much for that talk. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you well. Great. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about something that you and others talk about in the literature of these kind of two aspects of adversity of harshness and unpredictability. Um, and so for the example you gave with working memory, right, it seemed like unpredictability didn't have much to say about ecological validity's importance, but the harshness me measures were much more important there. And so have you seen kind of patterns across different psychological constructs? Is there is there similarity? Are there things, is attention very different from working memory? Yeah, just any insight that you've seen as you've been starting to work on this more? Yeah, I love this question because it's, we're going straight to the heart of something we're trying to grapple with ourselves, a really difficult problem. I will first say that I think the terms harshness and unpredictability themselves um, have ambiguities in them. And so there are different kinds of harshness, for example, nutritional deprivation versus economic hardship versus exposure to violence. And unpredictability, you know, can be um, operationalized in different ways, like autocorrelation, change points in time series, um, variance. Um, you know, there's unpredictability in the sense of, oh, you know, uh, every year, you know, we move. Um, and so I don't know where I'm going to be next year. That's unpredictable on a time scale of years. But there's also unpredictability, like if I go to the corner store to, this evening, I don't know if I'm going to get shot or robbed. That's a different kind of unpredictability. And so one of the things that we're trying to argue, you know, in other work that I didn't cover here is that people need to be much more precise when they're talking about harshness and unpredictability than they sometimes are, specifically what they are talking about in their particular study and why that particular form of harshness or unpredictability might be linked with a particular cognition or, 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 or behavior. Now, to 
you know, to answer your, your, your question, do I see patterns if I look kind of across the studies? Really great question. It's actually a question we're grappling with as, as, as we speak. Right now, I don't feel comfortable yet um, making any kind of generalization there. But I, again, I really, I really care a lot about this question and uh, I'm glad you asked it. Can I, can I just touch on that, touch on what Andrew just asked? Because I was actually, I wrote down, I was trying, trying to, I think maybe I missed it, but can you tell a little bit about how did you quantify unpredictability? What did you yeah. use as the measure of unpredictability there? Yeah. So in this study, we use the measure that's often used. Um, and in the new work we're doing, we use a much richer set uh, of unpredictability measures. But in this study, we used uh, things like residential changes, different father figures in the house. We also asked people whether they perceived their environment you know, to be predictable or not. Um, and so it was a combination of self-report questions about you know, moving and things like this and, um, and interview questions. So it was a kind of so it, and it could be it could be that's because I was thinking too, if you're in a neighborhood that maybe has more violence, I'm guessing the unpredictability of violence will also be higher than a safe neighborhood. So I'm wondering if yeah, you know if maybe you could get it. Yeah. Yeah. So these these things tend to be correlated, but the correlation is, you know, is is is, is sort of at most moderate usually. Um so yeah, it's not super high. But it's super interesting to do also the interviews because, for example, there was a participant who um, indicated having moved like many times, like I don't remember, let's say like seven, eight times over the past five years or something like this. But then in the interview, the person said that that the environment was quite predictable. And and so probing this, you know, led to the person basically saying, I know I'm going to move again very soon. That happens to me all the time. You know, now I'm sleeping at my uncle's house. Next month, I might be at my brother's house. I might be homeless for a little stretch. Um, and so this person was basically saying, you know, I can predict that it's unpredictable in some sense, but it's interesting because we've got a discrepancy between what the person said in the interview and what we inferred from the measures. And, and it's because one is about perceived and the other is about actual residential changes, but it's super important therefore to sometimes have both of these things, you know, because you you might misinterpret the, the what the, yeah. Willem, we have three or four questions, I think, in the room that will take us a few minutes beyond the half hour. Are you okay with that? I know it's late. More than happy. More than okay. happy. So, yeah. so we're going to do it. Uh, I'll try not to abuse your time. Uh, do you okay. want to go, Jordan? Yeah, sure. So can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So when it comes to constructing the time series data like you are for like Ethan's uh, crime exposure, do you have a good grasp on what level of proximity actually ends up affecting a person's development? Because when you have like this block data where you know that could exist over like a kilometer or so it's really it's possible for somebody like Ethan to be in a crime hotspot but never personally experience it yes so correct. what work are you guys doing to like establish that yeah uh, yeah so so we have the, we can look at this at different spatial scales but a hundred square meters you know is actually a pretty small fine-grained uh, scale but still it could be the case that there are regular you know, uh, robberies, for example, in that block, but that Ethan himself never experiences this. So we also would ask Ethan, and this is the more traditional way of doing it, you know, using the kinds of questionnaires that we have about these types of experiences or exposures or from hearsay. Um, and so we can correlate this kind of more typical way of measuring these, you know, kind of lived experiences with the kind of more governmental, more objective data uh, of the surrounding environment. Cool. Charlotte, you had a question. Yes, thank you. Is it also working from here? You would just have to talk loudly. Okay, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. That was very fascinating. Um, I've been wondering a bit about the role of, or I guess, social roles or the perceived social roles or the possible sort of mediator between the environment and the individual. Mm -hmm. And you've hinted at it uh, at numerous points with, uh, for example, gender or sex. Could mm -hmm. you say a couple of words about how that might play into these uh, yeah, studies, various ones? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. So um, it, it's it's a, it's an area where my expertise is, is is a bit limited. It's a great question, uh, but I want to I want to um, make sure I don't say something um, that is not as um, as truthful as I as I as, as it should be. Um, 
the core of our way of thinking is to think about what are the challenges that individuals face in a given environment. And um, those challenges may differ between the sexes, right? And so there are certain challenges that are um, more salient to, to, you know, to, 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 um, to one sex or the other. Um, and so, for example, if it's the case, and I'm saying if, because this can be different in different environments, but that, for example, um, you know, males tend to resolve or are more likely to resolve social dominance conflict using, you know, threat of violence or even actual violence than females do in that kind of environment, right? Then, then you might expect that some of these de developed, these developmental, you know, skills or, or behavioral strategies uh, would be differently developed in, in males or, or females, for example. Um, the finding we had about the sex differences in empathic accuracy, um, we, we provide several possible explanations in the paper, and, and some of those have to do with, um, some people have argued that irrespective of socioeconomic positions, um, in, for example, like the United States, um, men tend to have more power in, 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 in some socioeconomic dimensions than women do. Okay, and so if that's the case, then, you know, um, then it could be the case that interdependence, if, 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 if you have less power and it's more important than to be more interdependent, to have other people, you know, to connect with and to kind of help each other, um, to have a sense of community in that way, if that's the case, then it could be, you know, that could be a possible explanation for why um, we, we find that it's particularly the men who are um, who, who are showing a worse performance if they have a higher perceived socioeconomic position. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> cautious because I, I really um, feel a little bit out of my uh, comfort zone talking too much about this. But but certainly, you know, it ma it can matter in this perspective. We appreciate the tax, <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. There you go, question, Nico. Yeah, a great talk. Uh, I have a question on whether or not you have a hypothesis about whether the type, there's better or worse types of adversity or the mm -hmm. degree of adversity mm -hmm. uh, that someone experiences. Because it seems that, you know, some adversity can spur growth and could actually lead to some improvements on specific measures. Whereas obviously like some advert like too much adversity especially during like the early childhood stage mm -hmm. could you know lead to like high stress chronic stress and that can lead to like worse developmental outcomes and so uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on disaggregating the idea of adversity into yeah. better or worse types yeah so you're absolutely right and I've you know not gone into the nuances of the timing of the adversity the dose of the adversity, the intensity of the adversity, the predictability of the adversity, um, you know, uh, it's sort of like there are many dimensions to, uh, uh, you know, how, how much an exposure uh, could matter, how people interpret, you know, an, an, an adverse event. So that's a really interesting uh, one that actually seems to matter too. So there's work, for example, looking at, um, you know, veterans of the army in the United States and comparing them to uh, warriors uh, of the the, uh, the Turkana, uh, and 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 that's a, a group of um, um, pastoralists in, in Africa, and they occasionally engage in like raids that also might be violent. Um, so individuals can get really hurt or even die. And they looked at the um, the, the sort of PTSD symptoms of both groups, the veterans and the Turkana warriors. They both are exposed to severe violence, um, potentially. And they both scored, um, you know, they had comparable levels of symptoms on the dimension of uh, kind of threat-related symptoms. So things like startle reflex, nightmares, you know, but on symptoms that had to do with, and this is work by Sarah Matthew and Matt Zeverman, it's beautiful work, um, but on symptoms that have more to do with depression and kind of loneliness, uh, the Turkana warriors had fewer of those symptoms than the U.S. war veterans. And mm -hmm. so 
why that would be the case is an, you know an interesting question but they argue that it might have to do with the way that these adverse experiences like exposure to violence how they are culturally filtered so a u.s soldier might go through these experiences be removed from home for months after the experiences then come home might not be able to talk about those experiences very well with other people kind of needs to process it by themselves might even feel embarrassed about some of the things that they that they would have seen or done or not done um, the Turkana warriors they tend to come home after one or two days then the group is kind of welcoming them back then they have a ritual that kind of you know cleanses the individual of their of the tough things that they've gone through it's like to help them process the experience um and so you know you could you could that th th this is not a fact this is an idea but you could imagine how that would affect how the adversity is going to have lasting impacts or or have fewer lasting impacts. so this is you know about how it's interpreted um things like the timing and the dose and the chronicity and the predictability of the adversities um yeah also can matter and um you know in humans we we can of course not experimentally like vary these things but in non-human animals people do experimentally vary those things and um and then they get much more fine-grained insight um yeah i'm sorry if i cannot give you like a no, it's yeah it's great one final question anybody um yeah. i, I had one, one? Oh, yeah go ahead oh, you, okay I was, it, it was really great well um, i was just wondering you know even, even, you know, when you adapt to these harsh environments, and this is something that Luis and I talk a lot about, that behavior that might look irrational from one kind of context, actually, when you think about that context, they look very rational. But one thing that I worry about is that, like, even, even say the things about, you know, the Seth Pollock work of kids who can detect anger more quickly, or um, people that are in more depleted environments, they might pick up emotion more quickly and more accurately i think in those contexts those are all going to be adaptive but then when you go into another context it might actually hurt the individual and and i just you know this kind of gets into this core issue where you know i think that we talk about too where I, we are going to have to start changing the environment because it's not it, it may be difficult for a lot of these adaptations to have people get into other parts of society where they can like build growth, trust adults and things like that. If they can't do that, it's going to be very, very challenging. So I'm wondering how how you how you think about that. So yeah, I yeah. totally agree. People are adapting to their environment, but then when they want to try to maybe leave that environment, if they can't release from those adaptations, it's going to be difficult to have success. Yes, yes I completely agree. So, you know, most certainly, and this is something that I sometimes even include a slide on, you know, uh, I sometimes like say like very clearly, like adversity is, is, is bad. We don't want people to experience adversity. We need to do everything we can to reduce or eliminate, you know, adversity. Um, an unfortunate fact is that a lot of people do grow up with substantial adversity and it matters how we as scientists study them it matters for how they see themselves. It matters for how they are viewed by others. And it matters for, you know, knowledge is power. Like if we understand better their kind of cognitive and behavioral profiles, um, we might be able to help them better um, uh, in, in a number of ways, um, including also to adapt to these environments that might be for them developmentally different from what they have been used to, but which are also very important for them to to uh, operate in, um, for example, as adults or in schools. Imagine that you grow up in a tough home or neighborhood, but now you go to a school that is actually quite safe and, and stable. So how do you get the kids to then adjust to the school right. environment? You know, And so um, there are many really interesting interfaces here. So I, I'll mention just a couple, if that's okay. So one is that there are um, people, Christina Bauer is one, David Silverman is another, Yvonne Hernandez is another, uh, Tiffany Brennan is another. And they show that if these youth who come from tough environments, you know, they, they, they're, it, they also are more likely, for example, to drop out of school uh, on average, you know? And so, but if you highlight some of the strengths that they might have and you help, you know, you ask them to think about their strengths and like how they're, their experiences and, and their marginalized identities and you know how they how this could have led in some cases to them 
um, you know, having particular abilities, um, those kinds of interventions can actually, you know, there are at least several papers, I haven't done this work myself, but there are several papers that suggest that they can actually really benefit their educational trajectory because it gives them a sense of agency, a sense of control, a sense of, you know, um, you know, I, I am more than the way that many people have kind of viewed me so far. Like I actually can do things, um, you know, I'm more, for example, like if they get a setback in the school program, they are more likely to then like bounce back into the program. So that's just one example of, you know, doing justice that to the fact that adversity has been really tough. And at the same time, trying to help the individual, um, you know, use it to their advantage in, in a way um, if, if they had the unfortunate experience. Another is uh, something that we haven't done yet, but that I'm interested in doing in the future. So if it's the case that, and this is so one general pattern that we do find, but not always. So there's one study where we find a big exception to this, but it tends to be the case that more ecologically relevant settings tend to help individuals from higher adversity backgrounds more than they help individuals from low adversity backgrounds. If that's the case, or in those cases where that's true, you can imagine that if you wanna teach youth um, you know, particular kinds of, you know, arithmetic or, or language operations that you might start, you know, in, in kind of this island of competence where they are familiar, where they can do pretty well, where they can build some confidence. I can do this. Oh, I understand how to do this. I can do this problem. And then this is something that's called concreteness fading. You fade away from the concreteness kind of to a more abstract version of the same problem. And so if, 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 you know, this has not been done, but this is something I'd be quite interested in doing to see whether you, so it's not the case that we would say, oh, they can maybe in some cases do better with concrete than abstract content. Let's just give them the problems only in concrete terms. No, for some jobs, it's gonna be important that they also get the abstract things down. And uh, with concreteness fading, you could try to, you know, to help build a bridge. Um, so that those are just two examples, but um, yeah, there are, I think there are many, many, many more. And so Bruce Ellis recently led a paper that discusses these kind of applied implications where on the one hand, we wanna do justice to the fact that these adversities, you know, are really, you know, um, horrible and difficult uh, for people. And, 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 and on the other hand, you know, how can we leverage some of this to help people? Um, he, he, he has a paper recently, it's a, a, a book, it's a Cambridge element. Um, which is going, uh, it's called the hidden talents approach or something like that, or the, um, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's going into much more detail on these uh, approaches, yeah. Thank you. So Thank I think you. we took a lot of your time, Willem, but it was absolutely fascinating, full of great ideas, wonderful work. Uh, you have to promise to visit next time <laughs> that that's possible. We'll hold you to that and to a wonderful dinner and some good conversations. But uh, thank you again. It was really wonderful. Have a good yeah, day. thank you too. Yeah, I'm really excited about this, you know, your institute. I, I've been reading about it and I've been, you know, really wanting to be there in the room with you. So again, I, I really look forward to seeing you in the, in the future. And thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you for your really interesting and kind of thoughtful questions. Um, we'll meet again. Thank you. Thank you.